In this presentation, I would describe and discuss several of the most interesting Roman finds from AC Archaeology's excavations at Quintana Gate in central Exeter, which took place in two phases in 2019, sorry, 2017 and 2019. These plans show the location of the Quintana Gate site within modern day Exeter. It lies around 400 metres to the west of Exeter Cathedral. The legionary fortress at Exeter was the largest feature in a complex of military installations which were in use in the immediate area during the mid to later first century AD. The fortress enclosed an area of 16.6 hectares and was constructed in circa AD 55 to 60 to, to accommodate the 5,000 soldiers of the Second Augusta Legion. As a point of reference, the 1971 to 76 excavations on the site of the legionary fortress bathhouse were located between the war memorial and the cathedral on the plan on the right. The excavation at Quintana Gate was the first large scale excavation within the footprint of the legionary fortress at Exeter since the 1990s. The excavation area was located towards the western corner of the fortress founded in circa AD 55. On the plan on the right, which is taken from the recently published Exeter A Place in Time Volume 1, it is marked as one, uh, Site 169. This is a post excavation plan of the military phase at Quintana Gate, which lasted until circa AD 75. During the excavation, remains of a number of features relating to the legionary fortress were uncovered, including an interval tower, the fortress ditch, the rampart, the perimeter road or Via Sagularis. Further inside the fort, fragmentary evidence for timber buildings, likely to be barrack blocks, was uncovered, subdivided by metalled paths. These had been truncated by later Roman townhouses, an early medieval ditch and modern features, hence their fragmentary nature. After the disuse of the legionary fortress, there were several phases of civil occupation on the site. The main features uncovered, which date from this period, were the town ditch. Although this was slighted, it survived as a substantial hollow, which would have formed the perimeter to the early Roman civil settlement. The former Via Sagularis, which was widened and resurfaced during this period. And several cesspits, a well and an oven. These features were peripheral to domestic occupation, and although there were probably buildings on the site of this date, it is currently uncertain as to how these related to or were incorporated into later structures. In the later Roman civil period, a multi-room townhouse was constructed on the southeastern side of the site. This had an associated hypercoast flue. Part of a hypercoast comprising a number of stacks of pillar was discovered, preserved because it had slumped into an earlier well. No in situ floors were uncovered, but the quantity of tesserae, over 600, found during the excavation suggests that the townhouse had at least one mosaic floor. A large quantity of finds was recovered during the excavations, some examples of which you can see here. In total, there are around 124 kilograms of Roman pottery and 971 kilograms of ceramic building material, most of which is Roman. In terms of certainly Roman dated small finds, there are 38 fragments of window glass, 104 pieces of vessel glass, some of which Denise will be talking about shortly, eight beads um, and a glass cabochon, four fragments of worked shale, up to 16 work bone items, at least 24 pieces of work stone, excluding the tesserae, which I've already mentioned, around 150 iron objects, 53 Roman coins, and at least 54 copper alloy objects and fragments, four of which I'm going to talk about now in more detail. 
Two copper alloy bells were recovered from the upper fill of a shallow pit. The bell on the left is a quadrangular bell with four feet, so it's Eckhart and Williams type one. It has a pentagonal suspension loop, which is rather worn at the apex, and simple decoration in the form of a pair of faint parallel lines which run around the circumference close to the base. It stands at a height of just over 10 centimetres. The type is reasonably common in Britain, with 54 examples recorded by Eckhart and Williams in their 2018 survey. Bells of this type have been found on a variety of military, urban and rural sites and have a date range of circa AD 50 to 300. The second bell is a tulip shaped bell, so Eckhart and Williams type four, also with a pentagonal suspension loop. Although it was probably of comparable size or only slightly smaller when complete, it has not been preserved as well. Although the iron clapper, which appears to be missing from the first bell, is visible inside this bell on the X-ray. The tulip shaped bell is Roman, but it cannot be more closely dated based on its form. The pit which contained the bells is shown on this slide in red. It was one of two shallow features which had been dug after the removal of a four post structure, which consisted of three post pits and one post hole which had been built up against the inner face of the, ramp of the fortress rampart. This structure, may resent, sorry, this structure may represent an access point onto the rampart, perhaps accommodating stairs. The two shallow pits directly overlay and were both cut into the tops of, nor of the northern and eastern pair of post pits on this structure. The pit with the bells measured at least 1.5 metres long by 1.5 metres wide and was 25 centimetres deep. The second pit, which was next door, was slightly smaller and shallower. The base of the first pit was lined with burnt organic material. The bells had been placed on top of this and the pit was backfilled within a short period. The pits were overlain by early Roman civil period dumping and levelling and were well sealed. The upper fill of the pit also contained an early Roman military buckle, a probable although fragmentary buckle from Lorica segmentata, two, two small pieces of vessel glass and some animal bone. There was a small quantity of pottery in the pit, 17 sherds in total, several iron nails, a piece of, piece of lead casting waste and, and um, further animal bone. The pottery included two sherds of Exeter flag and fabric 405, which was only produced during the lifetime of the fortress, so approximately 55 to 75. Six sherds of Lagrofa Sonc Samian, two of which are tightly dated to 45 to 70. The remainder could be a little later, with one sherd certainly after 60 AD. And three sherds, probably from a single Leonware cup with rusticated and rough cast surfaces, the date range for which is circa 40 to 70. Given that the pit immediately overlies a dismantled structure associated with the fortress defences, the dating of the pottery and the apparently structured nature of the deposit, it seems likely to represent an activity associated with the decommissioning of the legionary fortress in around AD 75. It will be interesting to find out if there are further indications of possible ceremony when the process samples from the pit are analysed. Eckhart and Williams considered the various functions and possible significance of bells in their 2018 paper, The Sound of Magic, Bells in Roman Britain. There is some documentary evidence to suggest that Roman bells could have an apotropaic or ritual function, and a number of other instances where context implies they were used in religious ceremonies or as votive offerings. On this map, I've used Eckhart and Williams' data set, which is available via ADS, to plot the sites where there is an indication of bells being used in this way. The red dots are for sites where bells appear to have been used as votive offerings, and I've included an example of one of these on the right-hand side of the slide, the first century Binnington Car Hoard, where a tulip-shaped bell was used as a container for 12 denarii. The green dots show the location of temples where bells have been discovered, although the contextual information for these is often quite poor. 
The blue dots are sites where bells have context, which suggests ceremonial usage or structured deposition. We have Lunt Fort near Coventry, where a bell was buried in the foundation of the Eastern Gateway at the first century fort. We have Newstead Fort in the Scottish borders, where a pit inside a barrack block contained a bell and a pig skull, as well as some vessel glass fragments and other animal bone. Kerleam Fort, where there are two examples of bells buried within barrack blocks, both, as, both associated with their rebuilding in stone in the second century. Skull on the Norfolk Suffolk border, where a bell was found under a layer of packed flints that was interpreted as a doorway in association with several melon beads and Hambledon Villa in Buckinghamshire, where a bell was found in a possible domestic shrine. There are also 17 examples of bells from 16 graves, all of which are women or children where aging and sexing has been possible, which have not plotted as they are slightly different in character, but they add weight to the idea that bells were used as amulets and perhaps that they might sometimes play a role in burial rituals. Eckhart and Williams data set contains just over 300 examples of Roman bells. However, as over half of these were recorded by PAS and many others don't have an archeological context, less than a third of those in the data set have even the broadest contextual information. This means that there are potential magni um, magical or religious associations for a much higher proportion that it might appear at first glance. It may also be significant that many of the examples of apparent, apparently structured deposits of bells are at fort sites. The second object that I'm going to talk about um, is a length of woven loop in loop or foxtail style chain, which has a loop formed from the strands of the chain at each end. It was recovered from a deposit within the upper part of the, fort, the former fortress ditch which probably represents leveling during the later Roman period. This leveling may have taken place around the time that the town defenses were enlarged. The pottery spot date for the context is 160 to 200 AD. The strands are corroded together so that the chain is no longer flexible and it is currently fixed in a very shallow S shape, 59 millimeters in length and seven meter, millimeters in width and depth. Chains of similar length and form are a component found on some Roman lanterns, which date from the first to third centuries and which are very rare finds from Roman Britain. Examples recorded by Eckhart in her 2002 volume, Illuminating Roman Britain, include the two hooked lantern components from Fishbourne, one of which has an incomplete chain in a similar style attached, a fragment from the top of a lantern from Richborough and another from Strajith Fort in Persia, um, and uh, two to three fragments possibly deriving from two lanterns from Corbridge. There are two additional PAS finds to add. Um, from Piercebridge in County Durham, we have uh, the hanger from a hanger from a lantern again with a foxtail chain. And from Southwest Suffolk, the semi-complete lantern, which uh, you can see in the middle here, which was found by a detectorist recorded with PAS and is now in the collections of Ipswich Museum. Based on the complete lantern in the collections of the British Museum, which is said to be from a plontis shown here on the right hand side of the slide, the Exeter chain could be the short central length of chain which attached to a hook component, as are the examples from Piercebridge and Fishbourne. This section is missing on the near complete lantern from Southwest Suffolk, although the two longer side chains are present and are, ag are again of similar foxtail type weave. Foxtail chains were also used on first to early second century steel yards um, or a particular type of steel yard, but finds of these are concentrated in Italy and there are no certain examples currently known from Britain. They are also seen on copper alloy lamp hangers, again, a rare find in Britain. Um, but the uh, date of the context of the Exeter find might rather favour the lantern above um, a lamp hanger. The final object I'm going to talk about is an incomplete copper alloy hourglass type candle holder, 
which was recovered from the same slot through the infilling of fortress defences as the foxtail chain, but within a layer spot dated to circa 220 to 250. As you can see, this object is in an incomplete and distorted state. And indeed, there are several smaller fragments from the cup, which I've not included in the photograph on the right. When complete, the candle holder would have been symmetrical with a cup at each end and a disc at the midpoint of the stem. The extrapolated height of the complete object is 75 millimetres. For examples, which are complete enough to establish the height, they measure between about 50 and 80 millimetres. They are therefore very small objects, and the extra example is actually one of the largest. The type is believed to date from the second century AD and into the third, and they were lathe turned. Roman copper alloy candlesticks are not particularly common finds, only 24 being recorded by Eckhart in her 2002 survey. Eight of these were of the hourglass type. The examples of hourglass candle holders catalogued by Eckhart were from sites mainly in the north of England, several of which were military in character, including Mary Port Chester's and South Shield Forts and Pentra Farm Villa, which is believed to have had an official function connecting to lead mining connected to lead mining. There are also examples from Lincoln and a villa at Castle Hill Witten near Ipswich. To this, we can add two examples recorded by PAS, the first from Thorpe, southwest of Newark-on-Trent in Nottinghamshire, and the second from Thornbury in South Gloucestershire. This widens out the distribution and makes the Exeter example seem like less of an outlier. It also moves away from this artifact type being largely associated with the Roman army. There are two broad types of hourglass candle holder. Type A has simple cups like the examples from Chester's and Castle Hill Witten, and type B has flared cups like the example from Thorpe. There are a few of these objects which still have an internal socket or pricket in situ to receive a candle including the example from Castle Hill Witten, which has a socket, which you can see on this slide here. There are also differences in the stem form of these candlesticks. On this slide, I've divided the stems of the British examples into the following categories. Single discs, which include Maryport, Lincoln, Thornbury, the two examples from Chester's, Castle Hill Witten and Exeter, a pair of discs, which is seen at uh, South Shields and Thorpe, a plain stem seen at Brough on Humber, and an elaborate central element, which is seen at Pentra Farm. The plain stem and the, and the elaborate stem are not paralleled elsewhere in Britain or in Europe. In addition to the 11 examples from Britain, there are 31 further examples from further afield which are recorded on the artifacts database. The largest concentration is from France with 17 examples, Germany, three examples, Belgium, two examples, and Switzerland with a single example. There are outliers to this central group in Austria, where there are two, Romania, where there is one, and Morocco, where there are four. For those which are sufficiently well preserved and for which I have been able to access the relevant information, 24 have type A or simple cups and 11 have type B or flared cups. In this chart, I've quantified the British and continental finds according to their cup type and their stem type. As can be seen, there is a correlation between type A simple cups and, sim and single discs on the stems shown in blue and between type B flared cups and two discs on the stems shown in green. There are several exceptions to the rule, but the majority do follow this pattern. As type B candle holders are slightly more complex, it is possible that they are a more developed form and therefore perhaps appeared at a slightly later date. However, there is currently no clear indication for this from examples with contextual dating as this tends to be too broad. I'm going to finish with a few words on the progress of this project. We are currently at a reasonably advanced stage with the post excavation assessment for the site and we expect to submit that during the summer this year. The site will be fully published in due course.
Thank you, Naomi. That was great.